How's everybody this morning? Good. It's nice to see so many faces out there this morning. I know we have some visitors. Visitors are always great. We love all of our visitors, but this morning we do have a special visitor. So those of you who've been here for a long time might remember Dennis Douglas, our former music director and organist. If you don't know Dennis, he's a great guy. He's going to be playing with us a little bit this morning, but he's here worshiping with us as he's uh, away from Florida for just a little bit uh, for a class reunion. Uh, so make sure you say hi to him after worship is over, even if you don't know him. A um, great place to do that is out in Koinonia, where we will have a little bit of coffee and fellowship. There are some treats out there and things to happen, so you can grab your cup of coffee. If you feel more comfortable, take it outside into the courtyard so that you can um, be outside with your coffee and your donut and um, say hi to all of our visitors, uh, but specifically to our former music director, who I'm so pleased to have here this morning. Uh, we also have Pastor Larry with us again this morning uh, because uh, Pastor Elisa left on Saturday with uh, Pete Bull and all of the kids that are on their way to Big Sky Ranch in Colorado. And as we get going this morning, they have a very, very brief message for you. You should be able to hear and see them on the screen. Go. Go. Because of you, Saints Stevens, thank you. Because of you, Saints Stevens, we're on our way. <laughs> I love David's direction there, don't you? Um, I wanted to add my welcome. I am Larry Hang, as, as Rebecca said, and I am your adjunct, part-time, mostly retired pastor. But this is the second week in a row I've been among you. It's a great privilege. It's almost like I'm a real pastor. So, um, this, is the, this is many things today. It's the second Sunday after Pentecost, and we have some great texts to chew on, some great texts. It's also Father's Day, so I just wanted to add my special welcome to all the fathers among us, and we'll pray for that vocation in a minute. Ah, let me take my mask off. It's also Juneteenth, as you may know when we remember the emancipation of God's beloved enslaved in this land. Unfortunately, of course, white supremacy did not end with emancipation, so there is much work to do, and Jesus calls us to it. But now we pray for the vocation of fathers. Gracious God, Pour out your spirit on all fathers and all those providing fatherly care. Grant to them keen insight into their children's needs. Help them to be faithful examples of truth and love. Soften their hearts so they might hear their children's cries. Strengthen their resolve to be men of commitment and faith. Lift and sustain those who desire to be fathers or those for whom a fathering relationship is difficult or traumatic. In times of sorrow and disappointment, let them know that you are by their side. In times of doubt and confusion, show them the way. In times of happiness and joy, let them see your face in all that is good and right and true. In all times, sustain them with the knowledge that they are your beloved children. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Soften their hearts. I love that. So, and... Oh. <laughs>
invite you to face the font and let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often pressed the other side. Set us again on the path of life, save us from ourselves, and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Here, God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. felt like I needed a little drum there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O Lord God, we bring before you the cries of a sorrowing world. In your mercy, set us free from the chains that bind us and defend us from everything that is evil through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite children to come up. Borrowed this from Pastor Eliza. Matthew, you're my you're my uh, congregation this morning, so welcome to you and all children who may be listening. Freedom. That's what I wanted to talk about this morning. Do you know what freedom is? What is it? Ah. Uh, well, yeah, it's a little hard to explain, so let me, let me give it a shot. So, um, if my hands were all tied up and I couldn't move them, but somehow somebody took all this rope off me and then my hands were free, I would have freedom. I would have the freedom to move all my, my hands all about, you know. So that's freedom. And guess what? Jesus is in the freedom business. Jesus loves freedom and comes to give us freedom. But not just from ropes, but also the things that can really weigh us down in our hearts and in our minds and in our souls. Things like worry or feeling guilty or feeling like I'm not good enough or feeling like I'm not lovable. All those things can weigh us down. And Jesus comes to set us free from all that through the power of his love. But what's he set us free for? Does he see, set us free uh, for being mean to others, for not caring about others? I don't think so. 
Jesus sets us free for loving everybody that Jesus loves. And who does Jesus love? Everybody is the right answer. That's right. So, so this is what I hope and pray for you, Matthew, and every, everyone else here and everyone else out there is that you know the freedom that Jesus comes to give, you, that you know the power of his love. You know what it is to be set free from whatever weighs you down, but also to set, be set free for loving everyone whom Jesus Thanks for coming. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am. Here I am to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks. Who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh, with broth of abominable things in their vessels. Who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills, I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake, and do not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob, and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. Word of God, word of life.
A reading from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith could be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he felt fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your, home, to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. I'm not sure, Luke doesn't tell us, but I think Jesus and his disciples went across the lake to get away from it all, to get some much needed peace and rest. But no sooner do they arrive than this tormented stranger greets them, wild, screaming, naked, and oppressed by demons. What kind of demons? 
Most of the time, I've thought about his demons as personal, you know, the kind of demons that can wreak havoc in our souls and in our lives, trauma, self-hatred, hopelessness, addiction, etc. But some scholars point to an interesting detail in this story that might mean that these demons were something beyond the personal. Check out verse 30. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, legion. So legion was a Latin term, comes from the Latin, for, for a unit of 6,000 Roman soldiers. For my fellow veterans here, that's about the size of a US Army brigade. So these scholars say that the term, the technical term legion means that the demonic forces of Pressing this soul weren't just of the individual, personal kind, but point to systemic oppression, like you'd experience under Roman occupation. Well, I don't know if these scholars are right or not. At least something to think about. What I do know for sure is that Jesus is in the liberation business and works to set his beloved free from whatever oppresses them whether we're talking personal demons or systemic forces. So vacation or not, when Jesus encounters this tortured, beloved soul, he has to set him free from whatever is oppressing him. Because I said, as I said, Jesus is in the liberation business. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. So yes, this is a story of liberation, a wonderful story. But it also has to be said, the story is also a bit strange as well. And to me, the strangest part is not the man in bondage to demons. It's not even the pigs running off the cliff. No, to me, the strangest part of this story is the reaction of the locals. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. Great, right? No, they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all of the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear seized with great fear. Jesus had just healed this poor tortured man, just liberated him from his bondage. And how do the locals react? Do they celebrate? No, they tell this Jesus from across the lake to get out of town, for they were seized, oppressed, and bondage themselves with great fear. Why? What are they so afraid of? Well, maybe it was just the strangeness of the whole episode. I have seen a lot of strange things in my time, but I've never seen demons jump out of a person into a bunch of pigs that run off a cliff. Never seen it, and so my hunch is neither have these people, so maybe they were just a little freaked out. Or maybe they were like a lot of Lutherans and were a little afraid of change. Now, I don't know how much compassion they had for the tormented man. I'd like to think at least some, but my hunch is that mostly they were scared of him. And they had their own way of dealing with their fears. Guard him, chain him, keep him in the tombs. That's the way they always did it. He might have been a demon-possessed soul, but he was their demon-possessed soul, and they'll handle him their own way. Thank you very much. But along comes this Jewish rabbi.
from across the lake, who sets him free, liberates him. And in the process, the pigs run over the cliff, the pigs being their main source of livelihood, it must be remembered. And I can guarantee that some people in that crowd whispered to each other, we never did it this way before. So maybe they were just afraid of change. But maybe the fear ran deeper than that. Maybe it wasn't just because this healing was different, strange even. Maybe, just guessing, mind you, because Luke doesn't tell us, but maybe what frightened them most was the freedom, the freedom this healing rabbi brought. And I think that fear of freedom could have been there whether the man's demons were personal or systemic. Speaking of fear of systemic liberation, I've been so troubled lately by the backlash to LGBTQ liberation, including the threat of violence at Pride events this month, including anti-LGBTQ legislat legislation moving through state capitals in recent days, including the persecution we see in Russia and Hungary and elsewhere. The liberation movement for LGBTQ folks has made major advances in recent years. And St. Stephen's, I'm proud to say, has been part of that advance. And I believe that Jesus, is, Jesus in the power of the Spirit, Jesus, named or unnamed, has been the, in the thick of it all, working for the liberation of his beloved just as surely as he worked for the liberation of this poor soul and the garrisons. But just as people were seized with fear at the liberation of the man in our story, so some people are seized with fear at the liberation of sacred siblings and the LGBT community. Why? I wish I knew. I have a PhD in counseling psychology and a master of divinity. And it's still a mystery to me, an awful mystery. I'm not a Freudian, but maybe Freud was on to something with his ideas about homophobia, which literally means fear of same-sex relationships. Seized with fear, dangerously seized with fear. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and wisdom about why there is such fear of LGBTQ liberation. But for the moment, I'm going to move from the systemic to the individual. Let's think about the fear of freedom that can operate in personal, in regard to personal demons. If Jesus could liberate this wild, tortured man from his demons, just think what he could do with the ordinary demons and all those people's lives. Now, wouldn't it be good to be liberated from those demons as well? To be set free from those chains? Sure it would. Freedom is good, absolutely. But it can also be scary. And let me give you an example. My best friend from seminary, who has given me permission to tell his story over the years, my best friend from seminary is a recovering addict. Some decades ago, he was in a death spiral. He lost his job as a pastor, he lost his family, he lost his home, etc. And there was a stretch in his life where I feared for his life. Long story short, and it's a long story, the law forced him into recovery. And after a lot of resistance, the program worked and he worked the program. Eventually, he went through the long process, and it's a long process, to be reinstated as a pastor, which he was until he retired. Meanwhile, he's closing in on 30 years of sobriety. And by the way, I believe Jesus in the Spirit's power has been in that journey, often in the guise of some very interesting characters. Anyway, my friend has told me about the fears he faced of being liberated. The freedom of sobriety was wonderful, he told me. 
but it also scared him because he was not only set free from his addiction one day at a time, but also free for some scary stuff, including stuff in his 12-step program, free for fessing up and facing up, free for trying to make amends, free for, for reopening his vulnerable heart, free for the risk of hope. So yes, freedom can be scary, including and maybe especially the freedom Jesus offers. Because Jesus' freedom, as I was saying to Matthew, is never just freedom from. It is always, always, always also freedom for. At the same moment, Jesus works to set us free from the ultimate power of sin and death and demons, ordinary, systemic, and otherwise. He also sets us free for bold, courageous, and compassionate discipleship, which can be scary indeed if we take it seriously. Just think, what if Jesus came and met us right here, right now, this morning? Came here right now to liberate us from whatever chains us down. That would be a great and wonderful thing, right? set us free from our demons, but wouldn't that also be a little bit scary? Set free for sacrificial service to those Jesus puts in our way, set free for a cause greater than ourselves, set free for opening our hearts to the painful needs of the world, and oh my, is the world in pain? Well, guess what? In the power of the Spirit, Jesus has come to meet us this very morning. He has come right here, right now, to liberate us from whatever chains us down and has come to liberate us for the risky adventure of following him. And so what should we do with this liberator? Should we follow the lead of the people in our gospel, give in to our fears, and chase this Jesus out of our lives? Or should we, scared or not, let him free us from our demons and let him free us for new life and trust that he will be there with us every step of the way in the adventures he has in store for us? What do you say we take a risk on freedom, his freedom? Freedom from old demons, freedom for new life. Amen.
Let us profess our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Holy God, you hear the cry of those who seek you. Equip our church with evangelists who reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promises of a home in you. Keep Pastor Lisa and all the youth mission to participants safe on their travels. God of grace. You hear the cries of the earth. Restore places where land, air, waterways have been harmed. Sustain those affected by devastating storms. Guide us to develop and implement sources of energy and food produ production that do not destroy the earth. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. On this Juneteenth observance, guide us continually towards the end of oppression in all its forms, especially white supremacy. Bring true freedom and human flourishing to all your beloved children. God of grace, you hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of all who are homeless, naked, hungry, and sick, especially Jim, Susie, Phil, Gregory, Dan and Myra, Lois, Barb, Eric, Pastor Edward and Lorraine, Oleg and Oli, who are POWs, Anton, John and Maria in Ukraine, Maria and Bob and Annika. Bring peace to an experience, to bring peace to any experiencing mental illness that they can clearly recognize your loving presence, God of grace. You hear the cries of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships. Comfort those for whom this day brings sadness or longing and accept now the prayers of your thankful people offered silently, out loud, or in the comments of the live feed. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithfully departed whose lives proclaim all you have done for them. And at the last, unite us with them as we make our home in you, God of grace. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name, and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust those spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your loving keeping. Amen. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to hear, bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Right, it is. <laughs> Holy God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, and the harmonious wor world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars, were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your Son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we wait that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us in this meal. As grains scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth that all may be fed with the bread of life your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. In Christ's presence there is fullness of joy. Come now to the banquet.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friends and strangers, <clears throat> that all may come to know your love, that we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God, the source of glory, God, the word of life, God, the spirit of truth, bless you all now and forever. Good. Go carefully in peace. Love your neighbor.